All right, and I believe we are live. Thank you folks for joining us here on another installment of Real Talk with Teron Poole. I am here again with Peter Webb. I had a bit of advice last time that I should pin your screen so both of us are showing. Let's okay. see if there's any way that I can. Uh, and I don't know if you're pinned, but we're just gonna go with it like that. All right, and we're just gonna conclude with part two of the first interview where we were searching for evidence of a pan-Arabian ethnos pre-Islam. Uh, I believe we started with looking for them in Assyrian records with Ar uh, Gindibu and his Arba'a and transitioned to the other Middle Eastern empires that were engaged with um, Arabian populations on why they might have got that name Arab. And I believe the last place that we concluded at was in the Umayyad period with um, early poetry. Uh, I do have some notes here, so I guess we'll just start with that. Anybody who's interested in knowing what we talked about last time we uh, met, uh, they can just go back and watch the video. All right, so just a little bit more background behind your book. I'm curious, how long did it take you to actually put it together? I mean, because it's well-researched just looking at the bibliography and the notes. Yeah, thanks, Duran. So basically the book started as my PhD thesis. And so I guess I started my PhD around 2010. And, uh, and so basically uh, it was sort of my PhD sort of took shape as I was uh, doing the research. And so I researched in a bunch of different things about pre-Islamic Arabia and sort of Arab ethnicity. And it kind of got clearer and clearer that one of the problems we had was sort of actually defining what Arab ethnicity means and figuring out who thought they were Arabs and what they thought it meant to be an Arab. And so that sort of the PhD was sort of on, on various different fronts. Um, and then that took about three years to write. So the three and a half years PhD was completed. And then um, I suppose I, then I kind of tore it all apart and tried to focus just on Arab ethnogenesis. And so I sort of shaved off part of the PhD and added a lot more stuff. And that took about another two years to go. So I guess it was a bit sort of like a five years of pretty intensive work uh, on that project uh, resulted in the book and um, the work is still ongoing. But anyway, the book is out there. Okay. And hopefully people go and check it out because I feel even doing these interviews um, it really doesn't do justice to the content that is in the book because it really goes over a lot of details that even talking to people um, who are interested in the subject, they ask the very questions like, uh, how did Ishmael come into Arab genealogy? How, what role does Abraham play and, and stuff like that? Um, so where did you get the idea of dividing the book in two parts? Yeah, so because it, it's sort of two different kinds of inquiries. One of them, the first part, which we talked about last month, was looking at the pre-Islamic evidence and trying to sort of deal with the stereotype that everyone kind of is familiar with, that Arabs are the initial people who lived in Arabia, and you can always call Arabian populations Arabs since, you know, the earliest records that they have. And so um, my sort of issue I had was looking through pre-Islamic poetry is like they don't use the word Arab and they have these other words that they like to use instead. And then suddenly the Arab word appears in Islamic era poetry. And I think that's a pretty important sort of moment there that we need to explain, which is why in the early Islamic period, in the Umayyad period particularly, did people actually start calling themselves Arabs in Arabic poetry. So the first half of the book was kind of dealing with stuff which is, um, you know, not my, uh, sort of, sort of not, not in the Islamic period. So it, it's not the stuff that I work with the most, but it's kind of the background to everything. And it's trying to use the theories of ethnogenesis, basically like a theoretical framework to try to explain the sort of the, the, the interesting and sort of unusual references to the word Arab in pre-Islamic uh, records, and then trying to explain why Arab suddenly appears in Umayyad era poetry when it doesn't in pre-Islamic poetry. So it was sort of a bit of archaeology and a bit of linguistics, which are not my immediate field, but I was linking them with ethnogenesis as a theory and Arabic poetry, which is stuff I work with. So the first part is kind of just trying to problematize the stereotype and explain where I'm coming from. And the second part of the book is a very different kind of evidence because it's looking at texts written in the Muslim period, right? So it's written like from, the, from some of them are from the eighth century, sort of the second century Hijri, 
and then most of them in the, the 9th and 10th centuries AD, i.e. the 3rd and 4th centuries Hijri. And so this is a time when there's a really huge amount of writing. It's also a time when kind of the idea of who an Arab is had already been kind of well established, right? So we now have a very different um, scenario. We're looking at the Islamic era and we're looking at how Muslims look back into pre-Islam to try to talk about Arab origins themselves. And so the first part of the book was really sort of wondering, well, who called themselves an Arab and what did they think it means in a pre-Islamic period where the evidence is very scarce? Now we move into a period where there's a lot of evidence and now it's sort of less about using theories of ethnogenesis and a bit more about interpreting Arabic literature uh, and trying to look at all the different kinds of Arabic literature we have that talk about Arabs and there's plenty of it. So it's like a different kind of analysis and that's why there's a lot more kind of referencing because there's a lot more stuff that we have to go through. The, the, the previous work was really more trying to apply the theory in a clever way to explain less evidence. Now we got a lot of evidence. And making sense out of it, I mean, I it was difficult for me. I had to read, go back and read and try to synthesize a lot of the works that um, you used. Did you have that difficulty as well? I mean, because just looking at the breadth of um, um, sources that you had to go through in order to write this book, I can imagine that it might have been mind boggling or some nights or some days you're just like, oh, I can't even rack my brain with any more of this. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're on the right track there. So I, I mean, basically, just the, like almost every type of Arabic literature written in the early period has something interesting to say about Arabness or Arab identity. And so uh, for certainly like this grammar, it's poetry, it's history. And so the, yeah, there's, there's so much stuff. And that is definitely, um, you know, when I sort of um, went, went from my PhD thesis to the book, that was the most of the time was actually in trying to make sense of all that Arabic uh, literary material and, and reorganizing it and, um, and, and trying to make sense because they don't always say the same thing. And so you've got to be aware that there's different discourses that are going on. And then how do you evaluate those? So like I said, it's, uh, it's always going to be a work in progress when you're trying to think about identity and how it's written up. But I think we found something and that's, uh, that's the core of all those three chapters in the book. Okay, well, let's get into it. The first bit of literature that you touch upon is Arabic dictionaries. Um, uh, Arabic dictionaries in the pre-modern time. Uh, Kitab al-Ain Kitab al -Ain by Khalil ibn Ahmed, died 791, uh, is the oldest Arabic dictionary with the oldest surviving definition of the word Arab. Um, my question is, was Kitab al Ain written in the late Umayyad period or early Abbasid period? Uh, it's an Abbasid period work. So it, basically all of the texts in uh, this sort of second half of the book are coming from Arabic literature that was written in Iraq. Uh, during the sort of Abbasid period, and most of it sort of in after the first 50 years, the Abbasids were done. So most of the stuff is happening in the sort of 200s Hijri, the sort of the ninth century. And so it's, um, it, 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 it sort of post dates all that sort of tricky stuff that I looked at in the first half of the book where people are sort of discovering how to talk about Arab identity. And so we get the first attempts here and um, Khalil ibn Ahmed is the, the first dictionary to, to try to sort of define Arab and uh, it starts the tradition of uh, pre-modern dictionaries talking about what Arab might mean from the perspective of like a lexical item, a word. And Al Khalil and Al Ain define Arabs as being as um, as a strictly a linguistic feature. In it, from what I understand, after reading your book, he doesn't mention anything about Bedouins, um, uh, Arabia. Uh, sorry, he doesn't mention anything about uh, Arabia, Bedouins, or tribes. Yeah. Uh, so, was there a debate in that period on what it meant to be Arab? Um, uh, surrounding linguistic features, or was that just the standard with how everybody understood uh, what it meant to be Arab was strictly language? Yeah, no, I think the debate is kind of the key part because I mean, whenever you have an identity kind of any, any place in history, there's always going to be different voices and different opinions. And so there did seem to be in the sort of the early Abbasid period, 
a kind of a debate between, well, how do we, how can we tell if somebody's an Arab or not? And so one of the obvious things is if you speak Arabic, then you're going to be an Arab. And this was certainly one side of the argument. And you can see um, Khalid ibn Ahmed's dictionary. It's very um, also sort of terse and very sparse in how he writes it. So he doesn't elaborate a lot. But if you extrapolate to dictionaries written a little bit later, like Ibn Dray's Jamharat al Lugha, or some comments made by Al Jahid in his writings, you kind of put them together to see that there were certain people who made the argument that if you speak Arabic, then you should be considered an Arab. However, there was an opposite side to it, which is not really dealt with in Khalil's dictionary very clearly, um, but it said that you need to be a member of an Arabian tribe. And if you've got a tribal genealogy and your ancestors come from Arabia, then, then you can be considered an Arab. And so it, um, this, uh, this debate had a kind of different uh, sort of connotations in reality. It seems to be connected to also Yemenis trying to establish themselves as Arabs. And so um, they came from Arabia and they came from certain tribes. And so they were arguing that if you come from Arabia and come from an Arabic tribe, then you're an Arab. But the people from Northern Arabia seem to have preferred the argument that, well, you know, you need to speak proper Arabic to be an Arab. And of course, the people from South Arabia in Yemen didn't really speak Arabic in the same way in the pre-Islamic times, didn't have that long linguistic connection with Arabness, they seem to know that. And so in the sort of arguing between Northern and Southern Arabs, the idea of whether sort of speaking Arabic makes you an Arab or whether being a genealogically Arab makes you an Arab was something that was debated and never like 100% resolved, even to this day. Was it Al Azari? In his Tadib al Luga, was he the first to kind of put forth the argument about uh, or giving Arabness a spatial and um, a spatial and lineage uh, based affiliation? Yeah. So um, the, yeah. So the Tahdib al Luga is kind of the, the earliest dictionary we have that is very express and very explicit. And he actually is the first dictionary that also reveals the debate. He says, you know, in typical Arabic uh, sort of literary style. The authors kind of give various opinions and don't necessarily resolve them themselves. And so they said, okay, some people call Arabs the people who speak Arabic. Some people call Arabs the people that are from Arabia and from Arabian tribes. And it seems that Al Azhari prefers the Arabian location and homeland and the Arabian tribe definition. But he's certainly not the first person to invent that. He's just kind of the first dictionary writer that put it out there. And so it, it represents an expansion from the earlier dictionary of Khalil ibn Ahmed, the Kitab al-Ain. But um, yeah, I think the argument can be traced already in the, uh, the early Abbasid period. It just took kind of like a hundred years for that argument to make it into a dictionary for us to find it. Okay, uh, and you mentioned that the later lexicographers will follow in Al Azari's footsteps. Um, does that mean that the majority of them uh, went in his his path, and that every and that nobody really focused on Kitab Al Ain's definition, or was the debate still going, but Al Azari just prevent pre presented a stronger argument, which prompted other people or more people to follow in his path. Uh, basically what I'm saying, once Al-Azari kind of put what he, uh, his definition in his dictionary, do you see a dwindling in the, in the definition of Arab being defined by language? Yeah, it's tricky to answer because the dictionaries aren't necessarily setting the tone for how everybody interprets Arabness. So an Azhari could write something and then subsequent dictionary writers might copy him because his dictionary was popular. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's in the rest of society. And so um, what I think the case is, though, is that um, you know, if we look in medieval Islam, like a lot of people were speaking Arabic, but not necessarily everybody would use the word Arab to refer to themselves. And I think that it became increasingly accepted that speaking Arabic alone was not going to make you an Arab, but you did need to have some connection to Arabian tribes. And so what becomes important is sort of like it's a question of sort of how prominent was Arab identity in the medieval period and how did they go about thinking about what it meant and what to, so what you needed to do in order to qualify as an Arab. And I think the, by that sort of 10th century onwards AD, so after the fourth century history, definitely there's a lot more evidence that people thought you needed to be of an Arab lineage uh, in order to be an Arab. Uh, and if you wanted to call yourself an Arab, then you had to have some sort of nisbah that, that relates you to an Arabic tribe. 
but it, it's not like 100%. You can also find uh, examples where people who spoke Arabic outside of sort of the Dar al-Islam, right? So like there's a guy, Ibn Fadlan, who went and traveled up the Volga River to meet sort of the, the people that lived to the north of the Abbasid Empire. And, um, you know, he's not necessarily from an Arabic tribal background um, or people ne necessarily know that, but because he came from the Abbasid sort of Iraq, people who were outsiders would refer to him as Arabi or so it seems in one or two quotes in his in his story. So like, there's always different ways of, of, of thinking about it. And maybe some outsiders thought, well, this guy speaks Arabic and so we'll call him an Arab. But if you go back to Iraq and you start speaking in Arabic to a bunch of people there, then maybe they have a totally different idea. And I think they did, that they wouldn't accept just any Arabic speaker in Iraq in the ninth century as an Arab. You needed also to have a genealogical background. So it was kind of like Arabness was in the eye of the beholder. But if you, you're sitting in Iraq in the ninth century, I think that most people would have thought by this time that you need to be from an Arabic tribe and coming from an original homeland of Arabia in order to be like a proper sort of Arab, whatever that meant from time to time. In your book, you mentioned Quran chapter 41, verse 44, as being one of the battlegrounds over which the way Arabness was conceptualized in that early period. <clears throat> you make a, um, uh, can you please expound on that? Because that was actually something in the book that I really didn't understand. Okay, what was the verse? Sorry, it was um, 41. Uh, it's chapter 41, verse 44. Mm -hmm. uh, had we sent this as a Quran other than Arabic, they would have said, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. So uh, this kind of goes to the crux of sort of the, the notion of like, it was, if the Quran is saying that it was revealed in Arabic and that was kind of crucial for the understanding of the message. And so um, this is a case where, you know, how do you interpret ethnic identity from that? And this is a sort of a, a one of the verses that was used to say, well, actually, you know, the, the Arabic speakers are the Arabs. And so the medieval exegetes took this idea to say, okay, the Quran was revealed in Arabic because it says so. And that um, that was important. The Arab of the Quran was important because it was speaking to an Arab people. And so um, that is a, a verse that was used by the people who were arguing that language was an important aspect of, uh, of Arabness because the Quran doesn't say we revealed you to the Arabic tribes, right? It says we revealed you in the Arabic language. And so that is um, that was sort of on one side of the people who, who thought language was kind of the touchstone of Arabness uh, could use a verse like that um, because then by this time, that's kind of how they imagined um, Arabia was, you know, it was a bunch of Arabic speakers, and it was one people, and the Quran was revealed to them. And so, yeah, and so that line can always be used, actually, if you want to push the argument that, um, you know, Arabness should be linguistically defined. And that's how I understood it for a long time. And it really wasn't until reading more academic works that I noticed, well, yes, there is a debate that um, Arabness consists of a spatial parameter and lineage. But yeah, early on, I was on I had the understanding that, yeah, it was just a linguistic feature. And you also make a very interesting observation concerning an early exegetical work by Mukatil ibn Sulaiman, where he gives the prophet, uh, and he died um, Hijri 150 CE 767. Uh, I made the mistake of not putting a lot of the dates on here. And I thank you for actually plugging in the, um, the the years the fourth or ninth uh, third ninth or fourth tenth because I did not write that in my notes and I know it can be very confusing when talking about this stuff to the audience so uh, but just going back to my question you make a very interesting observation concerning an early exegetical work by Mukatil ibn Sulaiman where he gives the prophet Muhammad an Arab identity but never mentions his lineage uh, so I'm wondering was the Arab identity given to Muhammad, given to Muhammad by Mukatil based on lineage or language. Yeah, so uh, this ties in with what you said a few seconds ago also about how you would, you know, traditionally understood Arabic as a feature of language. And so one of the problems we have here is the legacy of Arab nationalism from the 19th and early 20th centuries, because what's going on at this time is, and it's pretty important for how we understand Arabness, because um, today, you know, we speak about the Arab world going from Morocco to Iraq and Oman, 
kind of encompassing everybody. And so there's a lot of different geographical regions and a lot of different cultures and a lot of different places and peoples that are sort of part of the Arab world. And one of the issues that Arab nationalism had is sort of as, as efforts to build nations in the Middle East as we know it today was, well, how do we are gonna go and define Arabs. And the problem is that those regions had a lot of Christians and a lot of Muslims living side by side, and they were in many different places. And so um, the, uh, the importance of language in um, constructing Arab identity was really, really important in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And so we are the immediate inheritors of that tradition. And so that's why it's very hard for us to deconnect Arabness from language, because over the last 150 years, that's been the way it's been, it, it's happened. And so um, th that's sort of a, a big legacy of a kind of more modern work. But of course, they were building on something that was in the past as well. And so Muqaddid ibn Suleiman, so yeah, when he's talking about that um, Quran Arabi from the, there's a verse, recited verse, uh, chapter 41, um, he um, sort of does, says the idea that, well, okay, Muhammad had the Quran in Arabic, and so he must have been an Arab that, that way. So this would seem to be like uh, one of these early texts that is aligned with Khalid ibn Ahmed's definition of Arabness, which it is a feature of, um, of, of language. Now, you know, um, Muqattil ibn Suleiman doesn't sort of dwell on the point. He doesn't elaborate a lot. So I can't say if he also thought Muhammad's lineage was important, but in that section of his text, he is really focusing on the language aspect, um, which makes, um, so it makes an Arab Arabic by virtue of speaking Arabic. And if I understood another part of your book, when Mukatil interprets Quran chapter nine, verse 128, he doesn't make any reference to it being um, any reference to Arabs ethnic, ethnicity. Uh, ethnicity. Uh, and so from Mukatil's um, from Mukatil's exegetical work, sorry, uh, just to explain myself, I'm reading my notes off of my phone. Every time before this, I've had them written on little note cards. I just wanted to try this to see if it's more, uh, you know, economical. But um, it's really hard actually reading notes off your phone. So please just bear with me. Uh, all right. So, but now, um, so after the exegetical work of Mukatil Ibn Suleiman, you have tafsirs by al tabari uh, al zamakshari and al qurtubi and they also give the prophet an arab um, arab um, they also give the prophet an arab identity but this time they provide a lineage for him where do they where do they get that from so I guess the easiest way to, to, to deal with that is looking at the Tadari's um, tafsir, because A, it's, it's, it's big and it's famous and it has quite an important legacy for later um, commentators on the Quran. So what's different, Muqatil ibn Suleiman is writing, as I said, not a very expanded commentary. So he just kind of takes the verses, gives you a little bit of an explanation, and goes on to the next verse. A Tabari, on the other hand, he takes a verse and then he gives an explanation based on various opinions that he had heard from previous scholars. And so Tabari's approach was, I'm gonna give you all the approaches that I've heard. And so each verse um, gets, you know, maybe seven or eight or nine different opinions, or, you know, four examples of opinion A and five examples of opinion B. And so what Tabari is evidencing here is that there are people who are commenting on these verses who refer to Muhammad as the Arab prophet. And in order for them to explain what they mean, they're inserting genealogy into that, like, you know, he's from the Quraysh and the Quraysh are from the, 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 the tribe of, you know, the, 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 the Mad and Ismail line. And so they're definitely Arabs. And then they speak Arabic. And so that's sort of, um, they elaborate more. And so you can see that um, the Arab lineage is, um, is something that, um, you know, becomes, that really is on the mind of the people commenting on the Quran. They're a hundred years after, you know, Muqatil ibn Suleiman. So you can see that sort of genealogy argument getting stronger. And I think it is an important aspect of Arabness in sort of the second, eighth century and in the third, ninth century. And so the, once again, it shows that those really early opinions like the early dictionary of Khalid ibn Ahmad and like the, the, the commentaries of, uh, of Muqatil ibn Suleiman, that their interest in language first kind of gets, has to now share space with language and genealogy together. And it eventually it kind of goes even further. 
uh, and they, they, they say that, well, actually, you don't need to speak perfect Arabic to be an Arab as long as you're from an Arab tribe. So you can see kind of like a process that sort of started with language maybe being the most important, and then it shared space between language and genealogy, and then kind of language dropped out and genealogy remained kind of the touchstone of Arabic. So at least that's how I, I read it. It's going in Iraqi contexts in the third and the, uh, the, the fourth centuries history, ninth and tenth centuries AD. Yeah, that's actually something that I found very interesting that um, you don't have to speak correct Arabic or speak Arabic at all. As long as you have the lineage, you will you can be classified as an Arab, whereas you can be an Ajum uh, and speak perfect Arabic or clear Arabic. And that still wouldn't be enough to consider you an Arab. I'm wondering where did I I think that was Al Azari's um, yeah. dictionary where he mentioned that. So you also touch on Lancaster and Shyrock analysis on Jordanian tribal society in the 20th century. How is their study and findings pertinent to your research on Arab ethnogenesis? Yeah, so these guys, um, they traveled to Jordan and kind of lived with Bedouin tribes uh, or sort of semi-settled or sort of semi-nomadic peoples in, in, in the desert in Jordan. Uh, and they kind of wanted to study how do tribes in the early 20th century think about genealogy. Okay, because genealogy is, is one of these tricky topics that's a bit like race, you know, it's sort of like you can't change it is kind of what we assume. We assume that, by, that, that, that genealogy is like a bloodline, you know, like I'm related by blood to my grandfather and, and his grandfather and his grandfather and I can't do anything about it. But what they found out, which was very interesting, is that genealogy is actually quite easy to reconstruct. And so, for instance, if, you know, you and I, we, we think we come from totally different tribes, what uh, Lancaster and Shyrock were able to show is that if we really want to feel like we want to be a unit, me and you, then we can kind of tweak the understanding of our genealogy in order to imagine that maybe a great grandfather of ours have we have in common. And so you're from one branch of a tribe and I'm from another branch of this, but of the same tribe. And so the, the thing that is, is there, what well, their research is really interesting. Uh, and it's something that sort of Hugh Kennedy picked up on um, a little while ago, long before I did my work, which is that we can apply that to the medieval context where the medieval texts that write about genealogy treat it as a science. You know, they treat it as like, these are the tribes and these are the lineages and that's that. But um, what I sort of noticed we could do is you could think, well, actually the lineages are, are, are potentially changeable. And if you want, you can merge groups together and you don't even have to kind of like change the names. You just have to ch change the background to it. And mm -hmm. so, um, and I, I thought that their work and so Hugh Kennedy's invitation to apply their work more rigorously to, uh, to sort of the, the pre-modern context reveals that the ways in which Arab genealogy are, uh, are, are imagined in let's say third, ninth century Iraq might actually be very different to how genealogy was thought about in pre-Islamic Arabia or even in the Umayyad era. And so what we have is, you know, you have a time of 300 years between pre-Islamic Arabia to the Abbasid period. And that's a long time during which you can rework genealogy. And Lancaster and Shyok showed us that like, you really only need 20 or 30 years to change genealogical models. Like it happens quite fast. And so we have an amply long enough period for people to radically rethink who is going to be part of Arab genealogy. And this is pretty important because you remember this is going on in the background of using genealogy to be the sort of the test for Arabs. And so what you can do now is that, well, we can incorporate new genealogical lines. And so you can kind of create a new concept of Arabs. And I think that this is one of the big achievements of Arabic thinkers and writers and, 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 and you know, political groups in the early Abbasid, sort of probably the Umayyad and early Abbasid period, where they were doing the stuff that Shryok and, uh, and Lancaster noted and they were doing that to construct an idea of what are the boundaries of Arab genealogy. And I think that they created new boundaries of Arab genealogy that were very different from what was imagined in the pre-Islamic period. And that was like crucial for this ethnogenesis, right? To sort of, to make rules about what an Arab needed to be. And um, those rules did not exist in pre-Islamic Arabia. I don't think, I think those rules were created in the Muslim era and it was all part of kind of setting the new framework for how Arabness was going to be interpreted by the Muslim, sort of in the Muslim era, and that kind of set the stage for all the subsequent understandings of Arabness up to the present day. 
And in your book, you give an example of a people who were able to graft themselves into Arab identity. Um, I don't know if they weren't beforehand and it was just convenient for them to go ahead and try to do that. But in your book, you mentioned the inhabitants of al Haras in Egypt had to prove their Arabness based on their claim of being from the tribe of Kada. Mm. I know the case of the Harassis. Um, I know in the case of the Harassis, they were able to see their claim through, bribe, uh, see their claim through through bribery and faulty witnesses. But how do people in that period, or how did people in that period go about proving their Arab lineage authentically, not using faulty witnesses or bribery? Was there like a legit systematic way they could go ahead and figure these things out? Yeah, I mean, okay, so it's a very interesting example, the one you cite there from al Kindi's text, and there are others um, sort of in an Iraqi context where we have people sort of dubious genealogy who kind of decide, I'm going to call myself a certain, uh, take a certain genealogy, and I'm going to insert that into Arabness. And these show us that, like, the, the if you imagine sort of Arab being kind of something that you can put a square around and, like, those are the people inside that are Arabs, you can see that the boundaries you could sneak in, yeah. And so there was sort of there was certainly a period in this early times when I don't think they fully understood how many tribal groups were going to make it into Arabness. Um, and there are lots of other examples, and some that like today would be considered absolutely 100% Arab, like the Al Azd tribe in um, in modern Oman. And in the Umayyad period and very early Abbasid period, it seems that like the Quraysh didn't call, didn't think that as were Arabs and the people in, in, in their, their rivals in southern Iraq didn't think that as were Arabs and the as were trying to become Arab because it was part of the being the elite of the sort of Umayyad and Abbasid Caliphate. And so I think the, the thing is there was no like actual policing method to figure out. There was um, obviously the uh, the caliphate had the idea of the diwan right it had registers of all these different um, social groups and those social groups were definitely considered to be arabs but it looked like you could kind of sneak in or and and the connection of your genealogy with arabness was something that was a little bit open for debate and so there were that that was probably the impetus for all these genealogical books like Ibn al Kalbi's Jamharat al Nasab or the, um, the, the uh, or just a, a Nasab Ma'ad al Yaman um, and and books by you know, Zubair ibn Bakar and these various other guys who were involved in in writing genealogical books because I think they were interested to try to figure out well how do we make sense of all these different competing claims for Arabness and can we put them all together and so the the Harasis were sort of making an argument to be included within Arab identity at a time before these books had settled down. You know, there were sort of various different ways of writing Arab identity and specifically at the top, like, you know, way back in the ancestors that would cover a large number of people, that sort of the original Arab had not totally been sorted out yet. And so that would allow people to sort of to jump in on, on sort of the, the in, into the Arab uh, inside. And so um, the, the, the diwan of the government was certainly important. Uh, you know, this is a register of payments that they would make to people who had participated in the Muslim conquests. Um, that's crucial in sort of giving institutional backing to Arabness. But the example of the Harashis and also examples of the other things that we see in the literature, like al Azd or some stories in al Jahad and many of these things, um, you had people that were clearly thinking their genealogy was Arabic. Uh, but that they might not have been agreed by everybody else. And so, um, yeah, so you can see it's sort of like, yes, they had a bit of way of, of policing it through the Diwan. There was kind of an official sanction, but it didn't stop people from cheating. And also you could just pretend you were from, a, from one of the tribes. So let's say like the tribe of Tate was definitely considered an Arab tribe. Well, okay, then you could just call yourself, you know, Tehran al Ta'i, right? And now you're suddenly there. And this actually happened, right? There was a Christian Syrian poet um, in the early Abbasid period called Abu Tamam. Uh, he was not from an Arab background, but he decided to uh, to take that genie to take that lineage, and he went to Baghdad and said, "Hey, I'm from this tribe." And so, you know, I think most people knew that he wasn't, but he used that as a way of sort of showing his Arabness. And of course, he spoke Arabic extremely well because. He was an Arabic poet, and he's the best, but um, in Arabic. But um, 
it's interesting that his genealogy wasn't and he had to fake a genealogy in order to kind of get included as an Arab itself. So you can see it was like, uh, it was kind of open season. You know, there weren't passports, there wasn't like, you know, a real rigorous administration and it let a lot of people in. And you mentioned uh, something from Al Jahiz where he asked a man or a man was talking about being from Kinda. And yeah. then when he was pressed on the issue, okay, well, what part? The guy said uh, he kind of opted out of going that far into it. So, yeah, I, I can definitely um, you definitely prove the point in your book or shown an example of people claiming to be something that they might not in reality be. So. Um, all right. And um, with the Kada'a, their lineage was also debated. They weren't people didn't know if they were Yemeni or Ma'adai, but um, I if I understood correctly, it was based on political affiliations and not any type of genealogy they were trying to um, wiggle into. Yeah, well, I think that they're definitely trying to wiggle into genealogy, but the Quda'a, they're kind of wiggling in of one and then wiggling out to go to the other one. And so the thing is that um, kind of this goes to the bigger point of like, in order for a certain genealogy to be considered Arabic, it needed to be traced to an Arab ancestor. Okay, and so the thing was that the the, the Quda'a were, were presumably known as a group of people that were living in Northern Arabia in the Syrian desert um, around the dawn of Islam. And they participated in the Muslim conquests and they were a big part of the Umayyad Caliphate and they allied with various different factions. But the point is that um, they, they, uh, in order to establish their Arabness, they had to say, well, we are originally descended from this ancient ancestor of Mad, um, but then that how it became politically difficult. And so then they had to kind of switch their, um, their, their allegiance to sort of curry favor. And they said, oh no, we're not from that branch of the Arabs, we're from a different branch of the Arabs. And so they're a great example of a group that kind of, their, their ancient ancestry was not, uh, was certainly very fluid. Uh, and it's it's probably one of the better examples of the sort of the way in which you could reinterpret your genealogy, not by, you know, discovering the real background to yourself, but actually just promoting a different genealogy that was more politically acceptable at the time. So the Quda are kind of the best example of that. Um, but other groups like al as um, and certain subgroups of al as um, are, are also interesting in their way of kind of manipulating their genealogy to try to fit in with something that was more politically convenient. And so this goes back to Lancaster and Shryock, which is like, okay, yes, you've got tribes, you've got genealogy, but the way in which you can, you can establish sort of a brotherly relationship with more and more and more people, that's open to debate. And, and if you market it right, then you can, uh, you, can, you can join whichever group you want. It seems to be kind of, uh, uh, kind of easy actually. You know, you mentioned Al Jahiz, or uh, you cite Al Jahiz a lot throughout your book. I was just wondering um, what was his significance in you putting together, especially the second part of your book. Yeah, Al Jahiz. So he, um, I mean, he's certainly one of the great Arabic writers of the third, ninth century. You know, and he he's left some of the more intelligent works that we have like he was clearly a very very smart guy he was a very knowledgeable guy and he was living at a time when the sort of construct of Arab identity as it was going to be understood in kind of medieval Islam was starting to take shape and so what we have with al Jahid is we have a very intelligent observer at the time when Arab identity was really getting defined in literature. And so al has never kind of wrote a book saying, okay, I'm gonna talk about Arabs, but he was here when all these, he was there when all these um, sort of debates were happening and when all these sort of um, arguments were being raised and when people were pretending to be Arabs, it might not have been. And, you know, al Jahid himself was of kind of maybe a, an unusual lineage anyways. And he didn't like people who, he, he was a pro-Arab sort of supporter, but not necessarily Arab being um, sort of genealogically. And uh, so it, it's sort of, he, he's a great example of all the fluidity. And then he provides us with a very intelligent person who, you know, had a great amount of literary output. And so you can find stuff in al-Jahid that really brings us into the everyday thinking about Arabness um, uh, in a unique way through an observer who was was very astute and, and was able to figure things out and so um, that's why I use al-Jahid quite a lot and of course he is also um, I said uh, he has a big legacy you know every Arabic author in the subsequent centuries 
knows the main books by al-Jahiz, like Kitab al-Hayawan and his Bayan with Tabi'in. And so these also can be seen to kind of set the discourse as well. So the ideas that al-Jahiz thought were good actually have some power because of his legacy. Yeah, I really like the works of al-Jahiz. And uh, just because I, I have to show off my book, I, I'm so happy I got this book right here. I paid $25 for it. And then when I tried to find it again online to gift it to a friend of mine, they marked the price up $250. So um, yeah, I bought that in a used bookstore. <laughs> uh, all right, and is it safe to say that Al Jahiz was at a crossroad um, or in a period of transition where Arab identity uh, as primarily a linguistic feature um, was losing its appeal? I think you kind of already touched on that, that it wasn't, that there was a swift transition, like one day Arab is a linguistic thing, next day it's a lineage thing, but it was more of a debate happening um, and, and certain people were just taking sides of the debate and, and, and writing about it. So um, that was one of my questions, unless you would like to, um, unless the question was spot on, uh, was he at a crossroad? Was Absolutely, I mean, he's at that period when we get really a lot of evidence of these different opinions and then people are kind of trying to sort them out and um, that, that's for sure. All right. And so you mentioned in your book that matrilineal kinship ties were more prevalent in pre and early Islam than what later transpires. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? I tried looking in uh, your, the footnotes to find if you touched on anything more about the I don't think I was able to find anything so that's just why I wanted to ask about it. Yeah, well, actually, one of the books is in Arabic. It's Hayat Qattat um, did a book on the genealogy and sort of the role of women in Arab genealogy from kind of a pre-Islamic period. And so a lot of the stuff I say there is um, is kind of building on her theory. She's a Tunisian scholar. Uh, her book was published maybe about 15, 15 years ago or something like that. But um, um, it, it's very interesting an example that also goes back to kind of the Lancaster and Shryock's idea of being able to shift your genealogy, okay? And I think it, it, you can make quite a compelling argument that obviously today we think of Arab genealogy as the sons of a father, right? It's sort of like the father figure, the grandfather figure, and the great-grandfather. Like it's, it's a very male-dominated um, sort of genealogical system, you know? So, but it really seems that... Um, that is a construct of the ninth century AD, the third century history. That that's the time when, you know, let's organize Arabic tribes by men, men is, uh, is certainly, you know, the norm, okay? And so that kind of sets the standard. That's like Ibn al-Kalbi and that doesn't change, okay? But before Ibn al-Kalbi, we live in a time when they weren't writing books about genealogy. They weren't explaining how genealogy had to work. And um, you can see that in Arabia, there were certainly some groups that had patrilineal genealogy, right? Men were the waste of sort of the nobility, but there are definitely other groups where women are actually carry the nobility. So basically what this means is um, if you want to be an important person and you, know, you have aspirations of being a leader, it's important for you to marry the daughter of an important person. And so the matrilineal the genealogy didn't mean that kind of women were running Arabia, okay? So it's uh, like, um, you know, it's not like a world where everyone, like the, the leader of the tribe was a woman or that queens were the leaders of the big kingdoms. But what it was is that your status was tied to the lady you married and your mother. And so, for instance, if there was a king, then his daughters would be pretty important um, sort of uh, options for marriage. And then you definitely want to marry one of his daughters so that your child would be related to that king. You see, so it wasn't like so. It, and it seems that some of the groups in Arabia took this quite seriously. And so this is another issue about, you know, pan-Arabian Arab identity in pre-Islam. I think that actually there were many different sort of kinds of communities and some of them were more matrilineal and some of them were more patrilineal so it shows how they was divided and there were different kinds of groups of people um, and then you can see this so Hayat Qattat noted this and I think you can see it quite clearly in in how early Islam plays out uh, and what's really intriguing here is that sort of Sunnism and Shiism or sort of proto early Shiism and proto early Sunnism come to play in, in, in so much as sort of the Shia claims for their um, sort of their authority 
are matrilineal, right? They, they are not sons. They are not descendants of the prophet's son, but they're descendants of the prophet's daughter, right? And so that's, the, that's why they're important. And so, you know, they say, you know, it's like Fatima is, it is what makes us us, right? And so uh, that's a nice example of matrilineal genealogy at work, that you, you, you just base your importance on your grandfather from your mother's side, not your grandfather from your father's side. And so, um, but what happens, of course, in the first 200 years of Islam is that Shiite family or sort of the proto-Shia, the Alids, as we like to call them in this early period, they lose political power and they start competing with the Abbasids in the late 2nd, 8th century and into the 3rd, 9th century. And of course, the Abbasids don't have a matrilineal connection to the prophet. They're, they're not related to his daughters. They're not related to his mother. They're related on his father's side. And so what they do is they sort of say, yeah, yeah, no, the, the proper genealogy is through dad, not through mom. And this is actually a way of them sort of delegitimizing the Alids and the Shia. And so basically, I think that this is crucially important in recalibrating Arab genealogy. And it's sort of like the fact that the Abbasids needed to discredit the, the early Shiites and the fact that the Abbasids wanted to establish their own authority uh, fueled a process of promoting uh, patrilineal uh, genealogy. And then that's when Ibn al-Kalbi is writing his books. They become like the Bible for Arab genealogy. And then that idea carries on. And so what it does is it overwrites different kinds of communities in Arabia where matrilineal genealogy was more important. And it kind of helps homogenize everybody, right? Because now you have one system. It's through the father, it's through Ishmael, it's through Mahat, et cetera, et cetera. And um, through those um, sort of male lines, you can create a closed system of Arab genealogy. And I think that um, they, were, they were able to do that very successfully. And it had, politics had something to do with it as well. Okay. At one point in your book, it seems like you're trying to make the argument and somewhat of a strong one, if this is the argument you're trying to make, that when taking a closer look at the rightly guided Caliphate or Caliphate al Rasha Dune, one can make the argument that it was the it was uh, the succession happened based on matrilineal uh, kinship ties with uh, father-in-laws first, then sons-in-laws, and then when it got into the hands of the brother-in-law, it turned into a patrilineal monarchy. Um, it, I, I don't know if that's what you were trying, but that's the conclusion yeah. I came to after reading that. Yeah, like I, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as just to say, okay, it was just, it was totally matrilineal and that's how the guys got selected. But it does seem that the legitimacy of the candidates has a lot to do with their female ties to the prophet. And that makes an awful lot of sense, right? Because obviously once the prophet dies and you have your first caliph, well, who's he going to be? And, and it's like, oh, it's, it's the most important wife of the prophet and it's her father. That becomes the caliph and so it's like yeah that that that's about as matrilineal as you can get right and then it's sort of and then of course the the ali and his family they have a good line but also through khadija and through the other daughters of of, of the prophet um you have other options and these are the these are the girls who marry omar and uthman and 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 then and then muawiyah comes along and he really doesn't have a good connection like his his the, the women of his family they don't have a good connection to the prophet and um, they kind of invent or maybe they invent a wife of the prophet that nobody really knows about. And it's sort of these sorts of things that they, uh, that they try to say, yeah, yeah, these are our background. But you can see their kind of politics at work, right? It's sort of like in order to be legitimate, you do have to have some female connection to prophethood. And, um, and, and, and so the Umayyads don't have a very strong case but you know they try it anyways, right? And so it's sort of, uh, and, and this you can see is the beginning of more patrilineal thinking. And then the course with the Shiites becoming sort of a failed political organization in early Islam, um, that, kind of, that kind of ends it. And so I think that that's overlooked. And I think it's a really important point um, it, it, when we think about early politics of Islam and like the, Ibn Zubair and, and, and his relationship and his legitimacy as well. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about um, Abdullah ibn al-Zubair, because his matrilineal links to the Prophet were way stronger than his my opponents, being yeah. that he was related to Khadija, two of the wives of the Prophet Khadija and Aisha. And so that's why I kind of had that idea that, well, not idea, but reflected on that part that I read that hmm, maybe 
things kind of did play along matrilineal lines, even though there's nothing um, out there to say that's exactly what happened. It is just a very interesting observation. Um, do you think that there might, and that you actually really answered this question. Obviously there, I don't know if you can say, obviously there was a concerted effort to put down matrilineal uh, prominence in the Khalafal office of Islam. But I believe a strong argument could be made that, yeah, we're going to try to shift this thing to more along patrilineal lines if they did notice that, hey, the people claim, trying to claim the office of caliphate are doing it on the basis of links that are strongest through the prophet being um, through, through women, obviously. Yeah, no, I mean, that's what I was talking about a little bit earlier when you had the, the Abbasid house and that they don't have a very good matrilineal claim, whereas the descendants of Ali have a great matrilineal claim through Hassan and Hussein. And so, um, you know, because they, Ali married the Prophet's daughter. So the thing is that um, uh, the, uh, I, I think that this, the sort of circumstantial evidence, which is you have these two completing claims, one is matrilineal, one isn't, and then the one that wins is patrilineal, and that does it, that's the end of the sort of matrilineal interest in the genealogical writings. I think that we do need to connect the construction of Arab genealogy by Ibn al-Kalbi, who was a member of the sort of the Abbasid intellectual elite, um, to, you know, their, their writing history that is helpful for the people who are in power. And, uh, and that, you know, it's it sort of, the books kind of pretend to be genealogical science, but you know we know that genealogy isn't science and that politics can change what happens. And so I think that we really should um, take that on board that, uh, that the politics influenced how the genealogical books, which looked like the sort of dry science, but politics is behind them somewhere. Yeah, definitely a very important show. It looks like uh, a lot of books in genealogy were written in that time. So it definitely was an important topic. Uh, just moving on to the Arabness of Muhammad and other prophets. Uh, the Chronological Universal History Al-Muntazm by Ibn al Josi, of which he makes the claim that is free from legends, far-fetched details, etc. He cites a hadith from the Prophet Muhammad reported by Abu Dar, mentioning the Arabness of several prophets, Hud, Shuaib, and Sali. And Muhammad is also included in it, making it four. Ibn al Josi is not from the early Islamic period, uh, but the hadith that he cites is actually from a further back period than himself. But the only problem is that the prophet, as the further you go back, it's not the prophet citing it, but it's someone else. Uh, did, did I understand that correctly? Yeah, so uh, Ibn al Josi is the way into a kind of a big question that I was asking in, in one of the chapters there, it's chapter four, which is, um, you know, okay, if you're going to have an ethnicity of Arabs, which you do have, okay, by the the third, the ninth century, or even by the uh, the eighth century AD, you know, definitely people are calling themselves Arabs, and they, they they know they're Arabs, and they need that to mean something concrete. And so, one of the things that you need, if you're going to push the idea that genealogy makes an Arab, is you need to have the first Arab. Okay, that's kind of how genealogical models work. These people also are in contact with, you know, the rest of the people in the Near East who have the Bible, Genesis 10 and Genesis 11. These are chapters in the Bible that talk about the ancestors of people. Okay, and so there's a strong model that, you know, everyone can trace themselves to a father figure. And so Arab identity emerges and um, people start calling themselves Arabs. And so the obvious question is, who is the first Arab? And then you need to attach your genealogy to these different people. So from the modern traditional perspective, everybody who lives in pre-Islamic Arabia is an Arab. And um, so therefore any of these sort of ancient Arabian figures are part of the Arab family tree. So what, happens in time to the Josie who lives in like the, um, the sort of the end of the 11th century AD, he, uh, the fifth 11th century AD, he um, is living at a time when they had successfully homogenized all of pre-Islamic Arabian memory into an Arab story. And so Ibn al-Josi says, okay, let's look at the, the Quran. And we see that it mentions that obviously Muhammad is a prophet from Arabia, but Hud, Saleh and Shraib are also prophets who are not part of the biblical tradition, but they come from Arabia as well. So from Ibn al Josi's perspective, they had to be Arab prophets as well, because he thinks that Arabs were inhabited Arabia since ever. And so these guys are Arab prophets. And so he cites a hadith to express that. 
But the hadith is not one of these like, you know, bulletproof strong hadiths that you're going to find in all the best of mutawatir style traditions. Um, it's kind of just this, this, this opinion that's traveled through some time. And so what I use is that's kind of the jumping off point. Like if you say in the 11th century, you know, around uh, or the 12th century, sorry, in, in the, um, he lives in the 1100s, um, in, the, in that period of time, it's, they know that there are four Arab prophets. And I think it was very common knowledge. But what I wanted to do then is, okay, let's backtrack. Okay, so let, let, let's sort of, let's leave that hadith aside and look at sort of how did they, how did earlier writers think about Ud, Saleh, and Shu'aid, and how did they connect them to kind of Arab history? And so what I found um, that was quite important, I think, is that, um, that the sort of the, these prophets were sort of Arabized retrospectively, that the, in the very earliest records, they were kind of apart from the Arab family tree. And then as the Arab family tree got bigger, it had room to put them in. And so it was one of the key things that happened was that the Yemenis joining the Arab family was kind of one of these sort of the South Arabians joining the Arab family was one of these key uh, intellectual developments that built an Arab family tree that was big enough to fit Hud, Saleh and Shu'aib in. And so then they could become Arab prophets. And so what you needed was, um, it wasn't like there were supporters of Hud and Shu'aib per se who wanted them to be Arab prophets, but there was this process of the Yemenis pushing to expand the Arab family tree to include them. And that's what brought these guys in. And so by Ibn al-Jawzi's time, the process was complete. It was all nice with a bow on top. Yeah, It's sort of like, okay, Arab misses, this is how we define it. And these are our Arab prophets. But if you go back you know, to the second century AH, the eighth century AD, um, this was one of these things that was also being debated. And so what I try to talk about in chapter four there is the different options to think about who is the, the original Arab and then how the expansion of that enabled Hud, Salah, and Shoaib to be sort of, to become considered Arab prophets. Yes, seems like uh, there was an attempt to keep pushing the progenitor of, uh, Arab, of Arab ethnicity back yeah. further and further, yeah. starting with uh, Ma'ad ibn Adnan. And I believe you find that genealogy in Ibn al kalbis book, where Maad is um, said to be the uh, progenitor of the Arab family tree. Um, but later scholars will see Maad as not being ancient enough in order to be the progenitor of the Arab family tree. So uh, in your book, you mentioned Baladari, um, if I said it, Baladari, uh, replaces the geneal genealogy replaces the genealogist lie past Ma'ad Ma ibn Adnan part with Adnan ibn Udad. I don't even, where do they get the Udad from? I've, I've actually never heard that before. Um, Adnan ibn Udad, Ma'ad's grandfather. Anyway, uh, Ibn Duray takes it further back saying that the genealogist lies means they stop, stopped having Arabic names, claiming that the names then became Syriac even though the people were still Arab. That part I really didn't understand because before Maad, who is he talking about that had Syriac names? Yeah, well, I, you don't understand it because it's not very easy to understand. Um, this is them trying to um, wriggle their way into expanding Arab genealogy and not having good evidence to do it. Mm -hmm. So this kind of goes back to what we talked about last month where like, if you ask pre-Islamic poets kind of what's the big community that you're a member of, a lot of those poets would have said Mad. And Mad was this grandfather figure for a large number of Arabic speaking peoples, but they kind of constructed their community and their genealogy around belonging to Mad. And they don't refer to themselves as Arabs, but they call themselves the people of Mad. Now, what happens in the early Islamic period is the people of Mad becomes less popular a way of defining who you are. Like it kind of survives in the Umayyad period, but by the very early Abbasid period, it's really on the way out. And it's so, not expensive enough. Well, yeah, well, that, that's the thing, exactly, because Mad already exists in pre-Islamic Arabia. And so what I think is the case is that there were X number of groups in pre-Islamic Arabia who knew they were from Mad. And so they, they had been telling everybody that they are the Madite people for a very long time. And so by the time early Islam arises, 
Um, they, plus a bunch of other Arabian groups, participate in the conquests, and then they all settle down. And the Madites kind of think that they're kind of more established, okay? And they think that they're sort of the elite, but um, at the same time, there are other groups, especially South Arabians from Yemen, who also want to be part of the elite. And so we have this, this conflict between Mad and Yemen. Now, one of the things is that once the Madites start calling themselves sort of Arabs as well, they want to dominate the Arab sort of identity. And so the Madites say, well, look, um, the, they're the genealogy guys, right? They're saying, look, if you're a descendant of Mad, that makes you Arabi. Yeah. And so this, and so then there was this hadith that was probably faked, but it was this idea of like kadhab al masabun. It means the genealogists lie if they try to trace identity before math. Okay, so this is obviously a kind of a pro-Madite propaganda. But they say, like, if you're descended from Mad, you're an Arab. And if you try to say that there were people that were Arabs before Mad, no, they're just lies. Okay, and that means that you you might say that you 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 descend from you know Mad's great grandfather, but that's just a lie. You got to be from Mad itself. Now, of course, the Yemenis are going to be like, no, 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 <laughs> we are um, we we are descended from uh, from from an Arab family tree, and so this this kind of um, very technical sounding argument of who is Mad's grandfather and great grandfather and great 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 grandfather. All of this is is tied in with efforts of non Madite people to become Arab. And so, um, what also has a problem is that Mad is not a prophetic figure. And so, you know, there's the, he's not mentioned in the Quran as a prophet. Uh, and although there are some very fake hadith that start circulating that try to show Mad has some prophetic aspects to him, this is not popular. And what ends up happening is that they, um, that they want to say that Ishmael, son of Abraham, is the first Arab. And so then what they got to do is they got to somehow connect Mad to Ishmael. And so, of course, Mad was not related to Ishmael in any way that anybody could remember. And so uh, they had to basically invent stuff. And so they invented all these weird names, Syriac names and other things that they took from different sources to try to connect the original Madite genealogy to Ishmael. And so it was this very complex process of involving quite a lot of lying by the genealogists to invent a new genealogy that gave the Arabs a prophetic character. And so that's why we can't really make sense of them. And Ibn Duraid and other scholars didn't really know what to do, but they knew that the genealogy to Mad they understood. They also knew that they had to connect Mad to Ishmael. And they're like, don't worry about the details, is kind of what they're telling us. They're just like, yeah, there's such and such generations between the two. And you know, halas, that's it, right? We have uh, we have the genealogy. So they left us with a very messy model. And it's that mess that they left us with that shows us the fabrication. Right. That's kind of your smoking gun that there's something weird going on in the ninth century when they try to talk about Arab genealogy because it's not smooth. And, and what they leave us with is this kind of uh, this, this bulky thing with Syriac names and the argument that they're still Arabs anyways. And that mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. You know, I wonder if they were constructing these genealogies as with um, identifying as Arabs in uh, the Amsars if they were using it as a way of keeping this thing together as more different groups were coming into Islam. Um, I mean, and still, still even with that, we still had four fitness. Um, there was one other thing that I was about to say. Uh, oh, you know, the, your article in um, the Umayyad world, I didn't even know that you had an article in there and I finally came across it maybe a month after our first interview and I happened to read it and I took some notes on it. And we're not gonna talk about it in the interview because I know it's not enough time, but I do recommend other people if they're interested in mod identity in the early Umayyad pe period, I believe you don't, have, I would recommend buying the book, but I'm pretty sure they can find the article on your academia page yeah i don't think it's there yet but you know, i i um because it's um i'm not supposed to <laughs> not supposed to put the article because it's a uh, copyright but i'm sure if you search uh, hard enough it will be found okay but yeah okay. I, thanks for mentioning that because basically that was something i wrote um, after the book was published and so what i wanted to do was spend a lot more time talking about mad and what it means in the early islamic period and so it's kind of it's an important um kind of chapter addition to the book itself uh, and it really develop a lot of these mad ideas a lot more there yeah i thought so as well and same thing with um excellence of the arabs because of the context in which it was written in where arab from what i understand arab identity was dwindling and ibn kataba who 
is a Persian, uh, thought it would be in his best interest to kind of defend uh, the Arab by pinning that book. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry, I thought you were um, So let's see, sorry, I got um, Ishmael Ibn Abraham. How did Ishmael enter the picture as being the father of all the Arabs? Yeah, well, this one is a debate. Um, there's, there are many different views on this one, and it is kind of hard to resolve them. So um, the easy answer is the Bible says so, okay? It's, you know, I have, that as, one of my, I have yeah. that as one of my notes, and I felt a little corny writing that down, but um, that's what I get a lot. <laughs> the, well, in the Bible, it says the Keterites are the sons of Ishmael, and we know the Keterites are Arabs because they're in the Arabian Peninsula. Yeah. yeah, so the thing is that, um, now, of course, the Bible has nothing to do with, you know, the, it's, it's older and it's got, it's got different discourses that it's working with. It's got nothing to do with Abbasid history per se. But, of course, the um, Abbasids lived in, you know, Syria and Iraq, and these are places where they were Christians. And the predominant model for thinking about ethnicity was coming from the Bible. And so Muslims um, had this difficulty, which is... Um, you know, the Quran doesn't really talk about genealogy at all, right? It, it, it's a book that that seems to try to avoid genealogy, you know, like the Bible, Genesis 10 and 11, the whole thing is genealogy, and basically the whole Old Testament is genealogy too, um, in a way, and whereas the Quran is like a totally different style. And so if a Muslim meets a Christian in the 7th or 8th century AD, right, the 1st and 2nd centuries of Islam, then question will arise well where do you fit in on this whole genealogy thing who are you and so um the, the the quran doesn't really have an answer because it doesn't say muslims are descendants of ishmael right it it it, 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 it it's um it just leaves it kind of open and, um, and so this is something that i've been uh, that a lot of people have worked on um and so Certainly, um, so, um, the, the, uh, the, in, in the Old Testament, Ishmael, as you say, with the Kedarites, is a model for, you know, the um, people that live in, in some part of Arabia, probably on the other side of the Jordan River, okay? And so um, they are assumed to be um, sort of Ishmaelites and um, sons of Hagar, not sons of Sarah. And so it's like uh, Abe from Abraham, sort of a, a concubine. And so they... Um, and uh, that is the model for um, a sort of a branch of people. Now, what happens in early Islam is it seems that, that they wanted to connect themselves to an Abrahamic legacy. And um, there are sort of two options to do so. Firstly, you could say that Abraham was a monotheist and he was Hanif. And so that's what the Quran says. And so if you are a monotheist and Hanif, you are following the legacy of Abraham. So this is... Um, I think, I think personally the way that the Quran pitches the model, that basically Abraham is a good Hanif um, and, uh, and, and, and the people that follow the teachings of Abraham are the Hanafa. And so if you want, and, and, and Muhammad the prophet is continuing that message of being Hanif. But the, the Bible doesn't talk about Hanif. The Bible talks about Isaac and Ishmael. And so the Bible says, you know, it's all about the, the, the relationship, the covenant of Abraham with God and Isaac and the sons of Isaac, and that that carries prophecy. And of course, that leaves Islam out in the cold because that goes through a Jewish line. And so there's an idea here like, well, no, maybe we should get into the Abrahamic side by Ishmael. Now, the question is, at what point did people first start thinking that that would be a cool strategy to establish prophetic lineage? And this is a big debate and we don't know. Um, there's certainly people that called themselves Ishmaelites um, that can be found in pre-Islamic records, but do they also call themselves Arabs as well? Um, we don't know. I don't think they do. Um, the, the Quran does mention Ismail in a number of places. And so some people have interpreted that to mean that you know, Muhammad knew that his community was Ishmaelite and that he was uh, addressing the Ishmaelite people and that those people kind of eventually take the name Arab for themselves. Um, I also don't think that's true just by the way the Quran uses the word Ishmael. This could be another kind of hours conversation to try to resolve that one. Um, but the point is that I think what ends up happening is that the dominant group in early Islam is the Madite people. And then they need to find a prophetic legacy that's genealogical. 
And so they're the ones that are very interested in connecting Mad to Ishmael. And so then they develop this weird genealogical model to get them there in order to become Ishmaelite. But this is a really tricky issue that you could look at in many different ways. Um, the way I talk about it in my book is the way I still think it is. Um, I think that, and, and I elaborated in the publication that's forthcoming. It'll probably take a little while to be uh, published, but it's sort of sent away now to the publishers. Um, but I try to talk about the Ishmaelite connection more because I think it's, it's, it's very um, debatable how you want to interpret that. And, uh, but the only thing that is definitely clear is that by the early third, ninth century, um, the association of Ishmael with the first Arab was very well established in Arabic literature. Now, I don't think that a lot of people like 200 years before that in very early Islam were of the same view. I think that they developed that view over the first two centuries of Islam, and they didn't come out of pre-Islamic Arabia with that idea. But I said, that's a debate right now. But certainly by like 200 AH, you know, 800 AD, so to speak, um, they... Um, uh, Ishmael was considered the father of the Arabs, not Mad. And what they had done was they had connected uh, Mad to Ishmael to kind of make them father and grandfather, so to speak. In the pre-Islamic, in the corpus of pre-Islamic poetry, do we have anything about Arabs being, uh, having any type of prophetic bloodline or genealogy? Yeah, so that's the thing. So in pre-Islamic poetry, you really don't get people using the word Arab to talk about themselves. They talk about Mad and the word Ishmael or various the variations that could be Ishmael, um, they're not attested in pre-Islamic poetry either. And I think that's a very strong argument that people haven't paid enough attention to, that the name Ishmael is not there in pre-Islamic poetry, but of course it becomes a popular name in the Muslim period. And for me, that the, pop, the rising popularity of Ishmael as a name is clearly an important indicator of when Ishmael was being sort of promoted as a grandfather of the Arab people. So I think that there probably, but I don't know, were communities of Ishmaelites, that kind of people who thought they were descendants of Ishmael, but I still don't think that our Arabic poets from Central Arabia, who are the members of the tribes that wield the Islamic conquest, I don't think that they are totally aware of that. But this is a very debatable topic. Okay. And how did Catan come into the picture? Um, and maybe if I could backtrack a little bit, even though we talked about uh, Yemenis trying to enter the Arab family tree, um, it wasn't the first time uh, the Yemenis tried a few or two attempts to enter the Arab family tree. One, they were unsuccessful. And I think it's because they tried to attach themselves to Ishmael. Yeah. But in the second attempt, they were able to um, attach themselves to the Arab family, the Arab family tree, but by way of Catan, who yeah. is not related to Ishmael. Right. So how did the Catan, because that is mentioned in the Bible, Catan, I was wondering, did they draw that from a Christian Jewish source? Um, or was Catan something uh, known about in that? Uh, I just find that bit a bit a little confusing. Yeah, so, well, Catan, the Arabic word Qahtan, which is the Yemenis use as their ancestor figure, is not mentioned in the Bible, but the Bible has Yoktan. And yes, so yes, our yes. concept of Yoktan is that Qahtan, that's ah, tricky. I, I, I don't know the answer to that one yet. I really have tried to think about it. Um, Qahtan also is a name that is attested in pre-Islamic South Arabia. So in inscriptions from pre-Islamic Saudi Arabia, there is um, a sort of, it's like a, a name Qahtan is associated with kind of a small region in Saudi Arabia. It's not like um, the South Arabians of Himyar and Seba and these guys did not call themselves Qahtani, but they knew that the word Qahtan meant something associated with some people in some place. But what happens in the early Islamic period, or let's say not even early, this is kind of like the third, ninth century, uh, after a couple hundred years, um, Qahtan gets like balloons in size. He becomes the name that you attach to the first Arab instead of Ishmael. So what seems to happen was the guys who said Ishmael is the first Arab had the dominant view. Okay, this is like, let's say 150 years after Muhammad, so around 750s, well, 730s, et cetera, et cetera. So they, um, um, they the, the dominant view is that Ishmael is the first Arab, and then um, Mad attaches itself to Ishmael. 
And so that, that's all good. But now you have all these South Arabians who are not Madites because they're really not part of Mad's pre-Islamic history. And they know they're not Madites and they can't make the argument. Mad is too well established and they won't let them in. But they want to be Arabs. And so the point is that, they, well, then they will say, well, okay, Mad is an Arab by virtue of being descended from Ishmael and that we come from Qahtan and he is an Arab by virtue of descending from Ishmael as well. So they kind of inserted him as one of the children or grandchildren of Ishmael. And so this was considered ridiculous um, around the time, like the second and eighth century. And so they said, no, you can't say that you're descendants of Ishmael, go away. And so then the Yemenis tried something, South Arabians tried something even more aggressive, which is to say, actually, Ishmael isn't the first Arab at all, that our guy is the first Arab. So they kind of like over Trump the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Madites. And, and they, they basically say, no, you guys are only Arab by virtue of Ishmael marrying into one of our family trees. And so there's a huge debate. And it, 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 was, it was obviously kind of like, it's a, a massive thing that we like, how are you going to resolve this? Um, and I, I do have something called, um, so it's called the Sublime to the Ridiculous uh, Yemen ide Yemeni Identity in Early Abbasid Iraq. It was published this year. Uh, it's, a, it's a look, it's a very in detail look at um, early Islamic era poets that, that play with this idea of genealogy. And so it, this is kind of the battleground where um, uh, the sort of the identity, uh, Yemeni identity uh, and its Arabness was fought. And so it, it's a very long story and it goes on for like 150 years of arguing, but eventually the Yemenis, probably because they keep arguing the most and they keep arguing the best, are able to say that actually the first Arab is Qahtan or Ya'rub, the son of Qahtan, and that Ishmael is an Arab only by virtue of descendants from them. So by the end of the third, ninth century, that becomes the classical model for Arab identity. But this is like a 200 year serious debate that has actually some serious consequences. Um, you know, people get in trouble and like wars are fought over this idea. And um, it's certainly, while it seems very simple for us today, Qahtan is the first Arab, Ismail is the first sort of Ishmaelite Arab. Um, it, it took a long time for them to argue their way into that position. Okay, makes sense, makes sense. Yeah, because that's, that's tip, the typical genealogy that I'm aware of, Adnan for North Arabians yeah. and uh, Qatan for South Arabians. And even talking to a Saudi friend of mine uh, yesterday, um, you know, he's under the impression that that's the way genealogy or those are um, authentic genealogies, not understanding the way that they've been constructed. Yeah. Uh, now, looking at my notes, I have a lot more notes and I know that we've been at this for over an hour. I was wondering um, if once we get to the uh, philologist, which is actually where I have the most notes because it was one of the more confused, not confusing, but I just wanted to make sure that I got everything right. Um, I'm giving you the option of opting out of that part and we can reconvene when you, whenever you have the time because I understand you're a busy person. Because I still wanted to get to um, uh, when Arab identity started to decline in the Abbasid period, the Shuhubiya movement, and then how Jahaliya was constructed and how that impacted um, Arab identity. But then when you go into the philologist side, that just goes into a whole different um, era of how Arab identity was constructed because of the politics weren't there anymore. And from what I understand, scholars had more free reign in order to kind of um, develop Arab identity, if I, if I understood that correctly. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, those are two big issues. It's sort of once we've kind of, you go through the second, eighth century and the third, ninth century, and you have kind of the construction of, let's say, like a, a canonical idea of Arab identity starts to emerge as a result of debate. Then once you get into the sort of the fourth, 10th century and the fifth, 11th century, more things happen. You know, time goes on and the identity changes and what it means to be Arab and who actually calls themselves Arab changes. And, and actually, this is the period when we have the best evidence too. So that's why it's quite a dense part of the book. And I, I think it's actually some of the most important 
arguments in the book are, are included there because you can really point to texts and show things are going. Um, yeah, and I'm also sure we have gone on for a certain more than an hour. And um, if you, if you, I could, I could definitely take the option to uh, uh, to reconvene and to deal with that because I think to do that justice um, uh, is is not going to be easy in like ten minutes or something like that. So uh, no, it's not, and that's kind of what helped me up putting together a guideline because it's like. Once I even just started on the um, fourth to 10th century philologist, I mean, that right there is just a whole different set of notes that I have. Um, and then trying to reconcile them to make it uh, coherent. I, don't, I didn't want to, the way you wrote it, the way you written, the way it's written in the book, um, it makes perfect sense. But I think it's just my lack of note taking skills or something. I'm always trying to make sure everything sounds right and is going along a, um, a understandable uh, in an understandable format. But just a few more questions and I'll let you go. And I definitely appreciate you taking the time to chat with me about this topic. Um, I see it actually becoming more popular. Um, just before I go on to my last couple of questions, I sent you a link to a interview I was watching between uh, Mufti Abule and Imran El Badawi. And the reason why I sent you that link is because the first hour of that interview Mufti Abu Layth was asking Imran El Badawi a series of questions that I know you would have knocked straight out the park because all of it is written in your book. And I tried to send messages. Hey, this is the guy that you want to talk to because this is right up his alley. Um, you know, hopefully something transpires from that because I really do believe this is a fascinating work that deserves more um, publicity. Uh, so, Thanks. oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, and I can't wait for the, I mean, and, and just maybe we'll plug in um, your upcoming publication. You'll have another book coming out on the Jahali period. I believe it's more in line with your PhD thesis, uh, this book, if I'm, um, maybe I'm reaching I, by I, saying. My, yeah, no, it's, it's in line with the current project that I've been doing for the last four years. So basically after I published the Imagining the Arabs book in 2016, I started a project in 2018 on the Jahiliya. And so this oh, okay. is a couple um, sort of, books that come out from that um, but one of them is um, is sort of is getting there uh, hoping to finish it in the next few months uh, so that uh, that will develop the Jehiliya idea not about Arab identity but about kind of the idea of pre-Islam. Okay and uh, just the last couple questions about the Abbasid period yeah. so um, the Abbasids continue to articulate statecraft around Arabness, which is something totally different than what I understood because I thought the Abbasids were the beginning of Persian empires um, in, in the Muslim world. But um, you're saying, no, they continued on with this idea of Arabness, maybe not exactly like the Umayyads, but it was definitely there um, live and kicking. Yeah, I mean, so the Abbasids are actually a really long period, right? They sort of go from, you know, 750 up to, you know, 1260. And so, you know, you got like a 500 year period um, in which their power goes up and down and all sorts of stuff happens. And so there's not kind of one definition of Abbasidness and, and certainly not one definition of Arabness within the Abbasid um, political construct. Um, the way Abbasids, when they come to power in you know, 132, 750 AD, they, they inherit the Umayyad system. And um, they especially have to negotiate the powerful groups that live in Iraq. And so those groups are the Arab tribes, the guys who the poets are calling Arabs, and they really, really think of themselves as Arabs. And they're very clear about that. And so the Abbasids, um, in terms of their initial power base, um, they have a lot of people who think that they are from an Arab background uh, and who are proud of being from an Arab background. And so that kind of continues in the, um, the first 50, 60 years of the Abbasids is that the elites of the Umayyad period remain basically the elite of the Abbasid period. But of course, over the course of the sort of first 75 years of the Abbasids, you have the urbanization in Iraq. And you have the development of, you know, new cities like Baghdad, uh, you know, massive and huge cities. You have conversion to Islam. You have many people coming in who are from non-Arabic backgrounds, who, you know, speak Arabic, who are Muslim. And so you have all this sort of social change going on, right? And so the Arab identity cannot survive such massive social political changes. You know, it's sort of like, it, it can't, I mean, it will survive, but it can't survive without adapting and without changing because you know, the crux of my argument is that we shouldn't think of an identity as something that is fixed, but you have to think of an identity as something that responds to society, economy, and politics. 
And so in the origin of the Abbasid movement, you know, in early Iraq, when they set up in the first caliphs, the society, economy, and politics is kind of similar to the Umayyads. And so they continue the whole Arab thing in the way that the Umayyads did. But then over the next hundred years, all those parameters about society change. And so then, you know, what it means to be an Arab and how Arabs relate with other people, those relationships change. You know, they're no longer having big conquests and they're no longer, the Arabs are no longer a military elite. The Abbasids bring in Turkic soldiers and they bring in Persian bureaucrats. And, and so everybody's starting to get mixed up. And now the, the, the nature of power and the relationships with power changes. And so um, not all of the people who come in want to join Arab identity, which is an interesting thing that happens. And instead, um, you know, they start articulating their own identity through, you know, being Muslim or being related to the court, et cetera, et cetera. And so the political value of being Arab changes. And so, so by the time you get into the 5th, 11th and 12th, 13th centuries, in the context of Iraq, and I'm really only speaking about Iraq in this case, because it, it, if, you, if you pitch it wider, it becomes more stuff you've got to talk about. But um, at that point, then Arabness is not as politically as important um, in the later Abbasid period. And so that's why it's very clear for us today that you can talk about the Abbasid period as, you know, kind of a Persian style dynasty in a way, because over the course of their first 150 years, they go in that direction. But at the beginning and for the first 75 or 100 years, that's not the case. They are definitely continuing the, the Arab misventure um, quite strongly. And it's really only in the late third, ninth century where you start seeing Arab identity as a political, um, as, a politi as a facet of politics and as a social group uh, start changing how it is interpreted. Was the Shu'ubiya movement a response to a burgeoning Arab identity in the Iraqi context? Yeah, so the Shu'biya, so this is a, a word that's used to kind of describe in, in very crude terms, kind of Arab versus Persian dislike of each other. Yeah, And so um, it's also a very debated topic. Um, it's not helped by the 20th century where, you know, Iran versus Arab countries is a hot political issue and where sort of Iranian identity is something very separate from Arab identity in the 19th and 20th centuries is like a huge, like, the defining paradigm for the Middle East, okay? So what's happened is we live in a world where our Iranian nationalism and Arab nationalism are very well established in 19th and 20th century terms. And then those, those terms of the 19th and 20th century are often used to describe how the Shorabiya worked in the ninth century, right? So there's like a thousand years have gone by. So we have to be pretty careful about what we mean. But the Shorabiya does definitely mean uh, it did entail some sort of of conflict that has an ethnic element to it, that there were people who called themselves Arabs, who spoke Arabic, who were from Arabic tribes, who were related to the early conquerors and the initial elite of the Muslim world. And then you had people who were important in Iraqi urban society and who spoke Arabic, but did not come from those Arabic tribes and their ancestors were not part of the original conquerors but they had you know, money and status that was equal to the Arabs. And so we have these two social groups who um, have different backgrounds and who both wanted to be kind of respected and to be on top. And so the Arabs uh, would say, well, we need to be respected because we're the original bosses here, but the non-Arabs saying, well, actually, but we're the ones running the place. We're just as rich as you guys. And we speak just as much Arabic and we, 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 we follow Islam just as much. So there's nothing special about you guys. Uh, why are you maintaining your distinction? And so the Sharbiya is this kind of cultural sparring between Muslim Arabic speaking groups, some of whom think they're Arabs, some of whom don't. And so then it, um, it, it, uh, it, it sort of starts like that. But then some of the people who knew they weren't Arabs still tried to support the Arab side. So it's sort of like it's this cultural debate that was, is ethnically defined, but the members on both sides are not ethnically defined. Like, you know, you could go on one side or the other. And so it's really tricky, actually, to understand it. And one of the problems also we have is the Shorabiya movement is probably at its strongest in a period before a lot of Arabic literature was written. And so we're talking about like the early Abbasid period, uh, sort of the late eighth century, the early ninth century. And we don't have a lot of books from that time. So what we have is books from the late ninth century, looking back a hundred years, telling us what the Shorabiya was, 
but we don't have shorbia books per se. You know? And it's sort of like, um, so it's sort of like, you know, we're, we're, we're viewing it from a distance and from people who weren't necessarily involved in the debates in their everyday lives, but were remembering the debates as history. And so, uh, yeah, like I said, it, it's, it's debated what goes on, but of course it has a lot to do with the trajectory of Arab identity in the Abbasid period. And the, the, I guess the main takeaway I would say for, from the Shorabiya is that it shows that Arab identity was not able to uh, um, sort of consolidate its position as the elite of Islam, that conversion and that people speaking Arabic and that assimilation in the cities of Abbasid Iraq meant that Arabness could not sit on a pedestal forever. You know, you had people around it that were going to try to get status. And so that whole sort of decline of the elite notion of Arab identity is something which is happening. And the Shorabiya movement is one of the chapters along the way. Uh, but the Shorabiya movement wasn't really a success. Well, I mean, it's also sort of like, well, what is the Sharabia movement? Is it a political platform? You know, it, it wasn't really like a rival caliphate. It wasn't really like a rival political party. It was kind of more of a cultural argument. And so mm -hmm. in a way, it was not a success because Arabic culture remained a dominant feature of Middle Eastern cultural production for the next thousand years, you know, pre-Islamic poetry, Arabic language, Arabic, you know, dictionaries, um, you know, Arabic customs, you know, the, the, the interest in, you know, sort of the Arabic side of Islam, you know, Muhammad as the Arab prophet, all that stuff stayed. And so the Shurabiya were not able to kind of recalibrate culture such that we can forget about Arabic and just go back to, you know, pre-Arabic or other ways. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it, they did succeed or the, the outcome of the, the arrangement was that being elite in medieval Islam did not require being an Arab. Yeah, and so in a way that is, the Sharabiya might not have been actively, you know, platforming, politicking towards that, but um, the, the, the Arabs did lose the hold on politics. And of course, that's not necessarily a result of the Sharabiya movement, at all. I mean, it's sort of Turkic warriors coming in and new dynasties being founded and all that stuff. But certainly the new dynasties that came in didn't have to pretend to be Arab in Iraq in order to be in power. And so in a way, yeah, the Sharbiya movement um, set, the, set the scene for that maybe a little bit. But of course, it, it depends where you're talking about. Like if you're talking about medieval Spain, Andalusia, um, being Arab was super important in, you know, in the medieval period. But in Iraq, no. And so it, um, uh, it's sort of like, I wouldn't want to say the movement was a success or a failure because I'm not sure what we mean by movement. You know, it's a set of cultural ideas and some of the ideas of the kind of anti-Arab Shorbiya side become mainstream. Mm -hmm. Whereas some of the ideas of the sort of pro-Arab Shorbiya side, they also become mainstream. So it's kind of a chapter in the, the evolution of Middle Eastern culture. Uh, that uh, sort of is happening in the Abbasid period. Okay, and we will finish right there. Uh, what else I had left was, or what next we can finish, or <clears throat> excuse me, what, where we can start off next time is Arabizing Iraqi history, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, it seems like they, along the same lines as trying to bring um, other Arabian tribes into the Arab family, trying to bring Ishmael and um, and uh, Katan Adnan into the family, uh, they tried to do the same thing with Iraqi history from what um, I understand. And uh, we'll finish right there, or we'll finish right here and we'll start at, uh, excuse me, Arabizing Iraqi history next time. This is the last time I'm gonna use my phone for notes because I like using, I'm, I'm old school. Like I have to write on flashcards and I need to have them right here. It's just so much better, the layout. Um, so if there was any kind of technical difficulties, me stumbling over my words, it's looking at this, these small uh, letters or words on uh, Google Docs. I, and so I apologize in that sense. No worries, no worries. I'm just like your paper is, uh, is the way ahead. Anyway, good stuff. Okay. Well, thank you, Peter. I hope you uh, have a really good weekend and uh, try not to travel too much. It's like every time I'm talking to you, you're on the road. Um, your theme song could be Willie Nelson's On the Road Again, just by how much uh, you're on it. So um, 
I, th I really do thank you for this. And I we got a really good uh, reception last time. People um, were messaging me, wanting to know more about my um, uh, identity, what links I could provide them to read. And so uh, I think we, we got a really good reception last time and I hope the same with this one. Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Teron. Until right. next time. Talk to you later.